when I read about it on David's blog. I'd never heard of Bernard Natan until David printed this story about this guy who apparently, supposedly, had run Pathé Studios for a number of years and had also had a parallel career as a pornographer. And I read this and thought, that's an interesting story, but it can't be true because nobody could I'm a producer, I mean, you know, it's like you don't have the energy, you couldn't possibly have the energy to have a career in pornography. Uh, so I kind of, I did, I did a little bit of Googling, found some French language articles and some Google translated them and said to David, it seems like there's a huge misconception here about this man and it's worth digging into and finding out some more about it. So, you know, we then yeah. did. But there's no real venue to make this kind of film except the real art scheme, which has a very specific remit for making films that can't be made any other way. The, the fear was, um, I suppose the, we were more concerned that we would find a really good way of telling the story, but it wouldn't be pleasing to uh, the people concerned in the story, think, think, thinking particularly of Natan's family. So that was the thing that made me nervous, was that everything that seemed like, oh, this would, be, this would bring it to life, this would be interesting, yeah, but what will they think of it? And we hope all the families and this film uh, will help us to, to tell the truth, to understand uh, everything, because uh, before there was a lot of atoms, but uh, the best is a film, because he was a filmmaker and a film from Ireland. It's incredible. It's a very good thing for us. It's, and uh, we say thank you to Paul Duan and David Cairn. The toughest thing in the world for a director, I think, is when their baby is ignored, you know. And, and in cinemas now, I mean, what, I'll tell you what, that Savoy is bloody good. It's a nice enough. Phew, that's what cinema's supposed to look like. <laughs> so, but you've got a thing like Broken, you know, um, you don't, you, they're not even going to put you on the screen. Sure. You know, so you make a film, you go through all the struggle of making that film and you can't find a home for it. And then when you do get a home, it'll be maybe for two weeks and you're done. I mean, maximum, and then you're done. So a festival becomes your screen. You know, that film, having that film on that big white thing last night, the festival was wonderful to, have, to know that. And there's a big audience and yeah, here you go. Have a look at that, you know. It was a big night for Rufus to have that, you know. It's very important. I first heard about it just through friends who had done it before and I'm, I've been getting into a bit of acting myself and just kind of wanted to see what the industry was a bit like and kind of just have a look behind the scenes, that type of thing. And everyone that does it is really sound like and like wherever they're from, like France, Germany, Ireland, Cork, like they're, everyone's like just so easy going and easy to get on it. Um, like it's hard, it's hard, like everyone's, everyone will talk to you, no one's shy or anything, so. We're very pleased to introduce director Alex Gibney. Um, and we'll start with mea culpa because, of course, I'm sure you've been asked this question this week, your reaction to Pope Benedict's resignation and to what extent there's an interconnection between what you've been doing and what might have been going on. He resigned? Didn't you know? Hi, Aria. Um, thank you very much. That was absolutely just shockingly compelling and, uh, uh, as that lady just previously said, very upsetting. Um, from all the research that you did and some of the very um, interesting people that participated in the film, what, what do you think is the, um, is, is the main reason for why it's su such a pervasive and prolific problem within the Catholic Church? I don't know how much light I can shed on it. As you say, it is a complex question. It would be irresponsible to blithely say it was one thing or another, but you've pointed to a couple of aspects. I do think that the way that the church does act to protect sex abusers does act to um, attract them because they know that they will be protected. I also think that um, celibacy is a complicated issue, but I think forced celibacy is important in this case in the sense that um, since we know from uh, Richard Sipes' study that at least over 50% of priests have an active sex life, then therefore 
celibacy is a lie. There's a hypocrisy at the heart of the church, which means then that there is an innate secrecy and also system of blackmail regarding sexuality in the church.